gorgeous. Yeah, we can't afford this space. This is a, but it's a very <laughs> generous, generous people have let us use this space to continue our fundraising and stuff while we're while we're uh, under construction. So thanks for being here. I was going to say the words will cost <laughs> Good to go. Once again, welcome to Mediascape. This is the second night of the inaugural Boston Cannabis Week. Thank you all for coming out. My name's Scott Patano, one of the co-founders of Boston Cannabis Week. My partner, Lisa Finelli, is the other co-founder. Brandon from Show Off has <laughs> helped us here today with, me, with uh, Mediascape today. This is kind of like our brainchild of bringing together the cannabis and music communities. Um, our panelists are so gracious to donate their time this evening. I'll let them go down and introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Mike Crawford. I'm uh, a uh, talk show host with the Young Jerks and sometimes writer, journalist, about cannabis, mostly politics. Hi, my name is Joe Gilmore. I'm the president of the Massachusetts Recreation Consumer Council. We're a 501c4 consumer lobbying nonprofit. We represent cannabis consumers and we want to do all we can to update the community on important policy. Uh, uh, updates. Thank you. Hello, my name is Albie Montgomery, aka Cheddar, founder of Cheddar DVD Magazine, uh, CEO of Life of Plants Dispensary and Seed to Sale. So I'm here today to talk about business and cannabis and music. Cool. I'm uh, Chris Ferrone. I'm the co publisher of Dig Boston, a Dig Media Group, uh, the alternative newspaper in the city, Alternative Weekly. I'm uh, the editorial director of the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, which as of last month we're our own 501c3. So, um, and then uh, I guess very relevant would be that uh, we, we have a newsletter out of the dig called Talking Joints Memo, where we kind of just, uh, we aggregate. We are, uh, for the first time ever, we're like the original content people, but we couldn't keep up with y'all, so we figured we'll kind of try to get our, our mitts around as much of it as possible. With that, well, I'm sure we'll talk about all that stuff. Well, Chris, that's actually a great segue into <coughs> the first question with the nonprofit journalism. I know I've watched you and Mike over the years um, battle with the mainstream media and stuff like that. What are some of the biggest media challenges facing covering the cannabis industry right now? Cool. Yeah. Um, so for us, you know, we, we were in an interesting position in, in that the Dig has been covering. This is the Dig's 21st year in business. The Dig's been covering cannabis this whole time. So uh, a lot of you know a lot of that was you know there were a lot of times where we were the only people in that space. Uh, so the I guess the problem then was kind of, uh, you know, really negative attention from uh, authorities for having certain advertisements. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough now that I remember when we would get hell for having um, uh, even head shop ads and stuff. So totally different challenges. Now, uh, we, we really have to, you know, I'm going to talk selfishly about our, our challenges, is that there's just so much going on. We're a small operation. And we started that nonprofit so that we could cover uh, issues the way they need to be covered, uh, hard issues. Um, you know, a lot of prison reform uh, stuff, surveillance, the issues that we believe aren't getting You covered. covered patriot rights when nobody in the state would, Thank including you. the Boston Globe. So a lot of that, you know, that, that, and when we were doing that, and Mike was a big part of that, we started the nonprofit four years ago in the march to legalization. And we were, because there was, a lot of this coverage wasn't being done, the Globe didn't, was certainly not covering cannabis the way they are now, really nobody was at that level, we did use the nonprofit to cover cannabis at that point, at that time, because we were filling a gap. Now, um, really, the nonprofit doesn't uh, doesn't work in cannabis as much. Uh, there's a lot of other things because, frankly, it's being covered not at yes ad nauseum, not always the way we think it should be. And we step in and we we write stories when we feel there are gaps to be filled. But the challenge now is trying to see really read around all this media that's going on. And uh, I do want to sing your your praises a little bit. Uh, MRCC, and first of all, congratulations to, to Joe for, on, on the, being the new president. I, I absolutely agree with you, Chris, though. There, there really hasn't been much coverage since you know, the, the rollout of legalization in terms of uh, you know, the perspective of people from the community, people who have been uh, you know, incarcerated in the past and really deserve to be at the forefront of this industry. So what we've been doing at MRCC is attending every Cannabis Control Commission hearing since they started, since they formed. We live stream. We utilized all the technology that we could because we were young people. We have to be innovative and use the tools that we have. So we use Facebook to live stream all the commission hearings, uh, important city council hearings. Just keep people updated on how they can uh, be a part of the process and use their voice to influence uh, legalization. 
I think you've done an excellent job of that, Joe. There's a lot of stuff going on in the community that I know I wasn't personally aware of, and I learned through your live streaming and your Facebook updates You know that I follow very closely. So from the community, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for that, that stuff. Thank you. I just want to add, add one more thing. It's like when, when 15, 10, 10, 15 years ago, when, uh, when blogging and, and community journalism became like a thing, I remember, you know, I'd go to these journalism conferences, everybody, oh no, don't worry, bloggers are gonna be taking care of everything. You know, like, it's okay that newspapers are shedding their school coverage because we'll, there'll be bloggers at, at the school board meeting. And we all know now that's, that's bullshit. I mean, even the Boston Globe doesn't cover the Boston, uh, uh, the, Bo the Boston School Committee. So, but in this case, you are actually doing what everybody's like dream, that bloggers are gonna do this in, in every capacity. We happen to be fortunate in Massachusetts that MRCC is on top of this, but really that's kind of, that wall-to-wall -wall coverage, I mean, you, you built it out of nothing. I just want to shout out to uh, all the people that have been supporting MRCC to make it so that we can have this as our full-time job. We're, we're young, we're able to get out to these hearings, people have nine to five jobs, mm -hmm. and that's why we really do this to create transparency for the people who can't make it. Awesome. Yeah, Albie. Yeah. Along those same lines, you know, it seems like you're on both sides of the fence with the music and the cannabis crossover. Do you see, uh, music and cannabis have always gone hand in hand, you know, before legalization and everything like that. Now that it seems cannabis is coming to the surface and there's a lot more crossover in the platforms, do you see any similar challenges in how you've come up in the music side of things? Um, I see a lot of challenges. I still see several stigmatisms within the industry. Um, like if we take a look at like a Red Man or a Snoop Dogg, like they put their careers on the line for cannabis. They, they lost Absolutely. a lot of advertising money like 10, 20 years previous to today, you know, because they were a fan of the cannabis. So like what we see today is we don't see that coming back. So right now, if I wanted a pre-roll blunt, I would be, it's, I'd be stunned. Like you can't do that. That's, you're mixing industries. That's tobacco and cannabis. But this was going on 20 years ago. So for to, to make the pre-roll blunt, like, you know, that's shunned upon and saying that's bad, but this uh, vaping is okay. We're looking right now. Well, mm -hmm. we don't know much about vaping in the last couple of years. Well, we have plenty of folks who have smoked, you know, tobacco or blunts or cigars, whatever you want to call them, but we, we've seen that, but there's still that stigmatism. So I see that a lot within the music industry, and it's not crossing over into the quote-unquote cannabis industry. Yeah. And you know a lot about that, Mike, fighting at the Freedom Rally for years to kind of end that stigmatism. Yeah, I, I think uh, with the media, the thing that's frustrating is what these guys are all saying, but it's like there's two sides of it. Like you, you do it yourself, which is awesome, and sometimes you break stories, um, and sometimes you get ignored. Like, you know, we did that Netta story, uh, January 2018. They still won't answer our questions. Now everyone's <laughs> talking about vapes. We talked about the health, what's going on in the Spencer Jr. At first, no one talked about it. The Globe had ignored it. But now they're jumping on it with HCAs, which I was talking about, which is awesome. But they're not going far enough. The big problem I see in cannabis in the state is people say to me, Charlie Baker was he legalized cannabis. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Baker and DeLeo are the reason why we have bribery scandals. Mm -hmm. Baker and DeLeo are the reason we have still issues in cannabis where a lot of patients that I talk to are driving up to Maine to get their meds because it's a better deal. I mean, we have so many problems still in Massachusetts. We've come a long way, mm -hmm. you know, thanks to folks here, uh, everyone in this room pretty much, I'm looking around, you know, but uh, it's still, there's that problem in, when, when you report the truth and then they finally pick up on it, but they spin it and they don't tell the whole truth. And that's what frustrates me right now. So I want the Globe to rain down on Charlie Baker when he said now he's gonna support HCAs. Where were you for patients? Where were you for so many years? And where were you on, you know, basically you changed the law and made pay to play happen in cities and towns because there's so few opportunities to open now. If we had the law, Joe, right? From the beginning, Peabody, we would have never had wasted time in Peabody. Mm -hmm. We would have shops in Peabody, Mass. But Charlie Baker and DeLeo changed that law. Mm -hmm. And the Globe doesn't even seem to remember that. Like, they never mentioned it in any story. Well, it's funny you say that. Uh, Shalene Title brought it up at one of the panels last night, how nobody wanted to listen about the host agreements until this case just yeah. happened in Fall River. And now, all of a sudden, well, what? 
this corruption in cannabis? <laughs> and I want to, this is, I mean, there couldn't be a better case or worse case in point as for what, what the result of the decline in, in local media, uh, with the, how that has played out in the municipalities across Massachusetts. Um, it's the, the impact of basic <laughs> coverage could, would, would om I would bet, would wager, that would almost always be positive in the direction of, of cannabis advocates. But instead, we have these town councils. I mean, the phones ring off the hook at the dig. We get emails all day. There's 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. Uh, I don't know how many people out here realize, you know, the company Gatehouse that's now merging with Gannett, another newspaper company, mm -hmm. that they keep just, you know, uh, swallowing and merging these newspapers. They just crunched uh, 50 newspapers into, I think, 18 <coughs> around Massachusetts. So um, when you see Wicked Local, these are really kind of like fake sites. A lot of them, uh, these poor young reporters, they're, they're, they're working like five different towns. And you know, if they cover the cannabis thing at all, it's going to be, you know, them, re, you know, rehashing the press release. And who has publicists? Rich people, um, not not uh, always the applicants that we're probably going to be talking about on this panel. So, you know, this is this is like such a giant frustration of mine. I mean, things are literally going differently because there's no coverage. And when we do go in there, I think Milford is one example. I could be wrong, like a year and a half ago. Um, whether it's us or someone else, sometimes a global focus on one municipality, and suddenly, wow, there's tons of attention, there's less corruption. Well, guess what? That's mm. what happens, and, and the opposite is what happens when people, when there's nobody to cover it. Right. Um, there's nothing, you know, no, no grassroots effort, sorry, no grassroots effort, there's no, um, no, there's not even a gatehouse underpaid reporter, not even that. There's no patch. Um, some places there's just nothing, and we've seen what happens. Yeah, and that, Shitty PR campaigns. That, that, leads, that leads me to an interesting question for you guys, too, as we talk about the crossover between, you know, mainstream music, and there's so many celebrities now getting involved in the cannabis industry. It seems to have become the retirement plan for professional <laughs> athletes. Uh, you know, do you guys, I mean, there, there's a lot of frustration, I know, myself, but do you guys share and feel that, these celebrities with a platform almost have some sort of responsibility to help shed light on this rather than just step in as a cash grab. Oh. Joe, I mean, I know you probably have some strong opinions about uh, that. Absolutely. I think that anybody who is seeking to uh, profit off the of cannabis has to keep, keep the historical context uh, in mind that these communities have been destroyed uh, systematically and um, there's a lot of money that can be made. There was an article that came out that said one of the dispensaries in Cambridge is gonna make $90 million in one year. So if, if all that money can be produced, that money can be put to good use in terms of uh, working to uplift people who have been affected. And uh, so in terms of uh, someone from the music industry getting involved, I would say you know, treat it just like anybody else who, who we're trying to put our faith behind uh, as an investor. We have to look at the details on the paper. The devil's always in the details. There, there can be celebrities that say that they support equity, uh, social equity, but what really matters is what's on that you know, host community agreement, what's on that positive impact plan, how are you going to contribute to the community, and um, are you going to work with people from the community, or are you going to you know, do your own thing? Action instead um, of words. What do you think, Albie? Um, I think whoever wants to get involved can get involved. I would hate to put like a stigmatism or saying no, you can or you could, but I think it's up to like I'm actually I'm a I'm a I'm an EPL holder, so um, I'm in route to to get an open up dispensary. But the what the rules that are so in place for Massachusetts is I have to have a court at two hundred and fifty thousand in the bank prior to opening. Just that alone, like how can you tell me I'm an economic priority license holder? Right. Meaning okay, I'm disenfranchised, I don't have the opportunity, but I have to have a quarter million dollars to start. There's plenty of people who sold weed without a quarter million dollars. You know, so I don't know what, that, what the quarter million dollars is gonna change. You know, if I'm smart enough to find a location, I'm smart enough to get people to, to, to put it together, what's the quarter million dollars gonna do? So it, I think it's more or less not who wants to get involved, but it's more or less up to the people who regulate it to make sure like the EPL holders go first before someone with big money comes That's in. Right. Because there's plenty of people, you know, athletes, entertainers that can get in this game without a problem. But the folks who are less, less enfranchised or have been disenfranchised because of their situation, you need to give them a, not just a fair playing field, but you need to even the flat playing field and say, okay, Absolutely. Right, that right there, you don't need that. We're gonna give you a grant and we're gonna give you whatever you need so we can get you in the, you know, in the industry. And I think that's what we are on the problem lies probably with the state more than with any entertainers or superstars. 
Well, and I didn't necessarily think that they're a problem. I was just saying they have a platform and they may be able to help shed some light to these types of situations, you know, because sometimes our voice doesn't necessarily get heard from the point of the struggle, but if somebody beyond that identity is able politics. to help shed light. Yeah. Right, like identity politics. Like exactly. People will listen to people who are like them. You know, yeah, like, so sadly, really that's the world you. we live in, right? right. And especially marketing. Like, um, I, I think uh, the celebrity endorsement thing doesn't really help products in the long run, but in the short term, it does. Like, you know, it get their attention, you'll try that product, but if that product isn't really good, or a good deal, uh, can you know, yeah, People they should. Use so it. They the should consume. Has to be like A plus. So yeah. Gronk, I, if Gronk's product is an A plus, uh, people in cannabis aren't going to use it more than once. That's my. <coughs> no, I agree. I've, trust I trust me. I, know I, I tried. Product, I tried uh, Willie in. Nelson Ooh. stuff and made me. <laughs> so it never touched good? it again. No, 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 <laughs> Willie's reserve. Willie, was Willie's good. reserve was horrible. Oh no. They they were handing out samples at one of the high times cannabis cups and sorry Willie. That's that's disappointing. See. If they, if they sell weed, they need to smoke weed. Like, they need to exactly. be a consumer yeah. of the, the product they're trying to put up. That, yeah. That's my understanding. And, and that kind of leads us into the, the next question we had. Like, one of the biggest frustrations I heard yesterday from a couple of um, um, economic empowerment people, uh, social equity people yesterday, were the restraints on advertising and them trying to compete with the big, with the big boys as far as advertising goes. Um, how do you guys feel about that frustration about how the cannabis advertising space is being treated versus like alcohol has caught blanche to do whatever they want and be in people's uh, faces? I see vaping commercials on CNN. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Commercials. Yeah. So that, that speaks for itself. Uh, I think uh, the disadvantage is even as an EPL holder, not just the advertisement, but nine times out of ten, you're not even going to open up a, uh, a, a cultivation rent. You're probably gonna just be a dispensary anyways. So being that you're dis just a dispensary, nine times out of 10, you're gonna probably be carrying one of these gigantic corporations product anyways. So even if you think you're not advertising, you're already advertising in front of them just by opening in a store. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they, they, they already have an advantage by being first and being so ahead. You know, so like the key is not to let them get too far ahead that there's no more room to play. Right. Right. And the key is you have to even it out now, right. or if not, that was just a joke, the, the EPLs. They were just a joke. Cambridge, I hope to see you there tomorrow. Yeah, I heard about that. There are pretty Top significant regulations on other ads. I mean, like for tobacco in particular, I can't even begin. I mean, it's a, it's a two point, we run a, a, lot, a lot of tobacco ads and it, it's unbelievable. You can't put anything anywhere near it. Compared to that, and those are federal, uh, the state's cannabis uh, advertising laws really, I don't think they're, they're all that onerous, but of course we're in print, you know? So uh, yeah. print and online is pretty much, uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. There's one thing that actually does benefit our brands that I actually would have testified against, uh, which, which is that a certain per, uh, percentage of your readership has to be over uh, 21. Right. right, of course. Um, and so how do you determine that? It's that's like 85%. Well, we, have, we, have, there's a, there's a media, we have media audits and we actually, right. we actually pulled uh, boxes off of campuses and put them, you know, in some cases, you know, across the street. Really, also, really thought about it. Um, the truth is, Boston's a changing demographic anyway. But, uh, but really, uh, I, I mean, I'm always interested in seeing what the business owner perspective on this is because for us, hey, we're waiting for dispensaries to open. You know, this this whole local media problem that I talk about, it's going to change when there's, there's some competition. But you know, there's different levels of it. We talk to people in other states. You know, Colorado, the weekly in Colorado, Westward, some of you know, they went from 40 pages of cannabis advertising two years ago down to about 16 now, which is still millions of dollars a year, but they're already over that hump. We're not even there yet. You know, we never, when my team took over the dig two years ago, three years ago, we didn't, we expected cannabis to come, but thank God we weren't holding our breaths. You know, I mean, and uh, there's a lot more pressing issues than us in particular, but we don't go around saying this, but I'll say it right here. No one thinks about that, you know, really. Um, there, there are other, even more repercussions than people already realize for this unbelievable drag that the state has put uh, people through. You know, I was the one for the first year being like, all right, they'll get it done, just, you know, hold it. Now it's like, Jesus Christ, I mean, yeah. really? I mean, there's, there's, there's one dispensary anywhere near here, uh, recreation. We could be Maine. <laughs> Your Maine is a, is a little further behind, but at yeah, least so, they have. I mean, the, I'm not complaining, yeah. but really, I, mean, there's, there's, I wish we had Maine medical. This drag, yeah. Not that's... to mention that we've been through this with medical, right? We've been yeah. dragging under a different, under a democratic uh, uh, administration. So I'll probably be in the minority, but I'm like I'm completely okay with a slow rollout as long as it means that 
the people who are benefiting should be the people who, who are supposed to benefit. If, it, if we're just giving the money to the people who always have money, then I don't see that as legalization that I want. Like, I want legalization, no legalization without equity is how I feel. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. See, we Great. don't disagree. That's why, that's why I usually zip it on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll get to questions in a few minutes. The, um, we've been talking about a lot of like the negative stuff going around the regulation and stuff like that. What are some positives that each of you see about cannabis now, albeit slowly, but now entering kind of the mainstream media? Let me say that again. <laughs> Do you see any positives from the way cannabis is slowly entering the, the mainstream media now? Because before you guys were reporting from underground I and- mean, There are more jobs. I mean, you know, the Globe, they, they hired some people. Like, so I think like there's more media opportunities. Um, I don't know. I think Dick Boston has a future because of it. Like yeah, hopefully. things like that. No. So I mean, I, th I think there's some bright skies there. But um, do you think there's I some think that's positives? That's the big challenge we talked about earlier too. Like for like local folks who are starting out, like how do you get paid? Like that's a big issue in media. How do you keep you know survive? Just like everyone, every other business, oh, yeah. it's taken huge hits. But I think there's opportunities because there aren't as many you know people covering things, like Chris said, so many newspapers gone out, so I do you, think, you know. Do you think it's been positive though, the reach to, it's reaching more people now, people are getting more educated because of it, do you see any positives in that way, Joe? I, I think, I would say so, uh, like with access to social, with social media being such an integral part of uh, people's lives now, it's so easy to disseminate information to people, like at a click of a button, I could be live and you're, you're watching the city council hearing from your desk at work. Um, so, yeah, we just try to utilize technology as much as possible, um, you know, to get our message out there. Excellent. And now one of the positives for me, like one of the things when people talk to me about, you know, I've talked about music and the, the crossover and stuff like that. Music has always been a very positive influence in my life and I feel like music has brought people together and, you know, you go to a concert and you leave your troubles behind and you know, everybody is there for the music and, and getting along. Do you guys see cannabis as a similar platform in that way? I mean, a lot of these festivals now are big on the, you know, the names of the bands coming in and, and stuff like that. Do you, how do you guys feel about that crossover and what do you see? Yeah. Oh, cannabis uh, community is probably like the most friendly community in the world, right. especially in the United States right now. You know, yeah. like, the, like the real cannabis community is nothing but love. It's all love. Like people share, people, you know, they love each other. And no one's not trying to say, oh, I want your stuff. They're like, yeah, hey, this is what we're doing over here. This is what we're doing. So it's a very sharing community from where I sit. You know? From where I sit, I'm seeing a lot of craziness in the cannabis community. But in terms of <laughs> no, that, me too. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. True smokers, right? Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. 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 Smokers. Yeah. Not, not the people. I'm, on the I'm business not necessarily side. talking about the business yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah. Not I'm the business talking side. about yeah. Just the people yeah. enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. from the same concept as the concert goer, you know, because exactly. that's a different conversation, right? If we're talking about the promoting market in Boston, which we won't get into, yeah, but you know, th yeah. that's a little different. But yeah, the, as the concert goer, as the person who attends these events the and stuff rally like that. is that. Like it's exactly. the music community and the, the marijuana. Perfect example. Like that's like, I think, one of the reasons why that festival did so well. It's like from both. It's like, was the local music thing and like the place for cannabis and brought them together. People loved it, like they still do. Like that's like, I think a big part of cannabis reform is like musicians really did champion that even way before any of us were here like you know you know we know jazz artists yeah. just going way back yeah Bob Molly, Peter yeah. Tosh I mean so. it's I think that's like the music is like a critical component to, or, or, or like marijuana is so integral to music because it's so prevalent throughout all types of music so if if that's the common theme then we can you know put this together and have like a really strong movement you know, that, and I think that's what, in part, the Mass Can Freedom Rally is about, is we all enjoy weed, we all enjoy music, let's make some political action happen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, not about let's see who can take credit for it and let's all get together and, exactly. you know, throw in some music and vibe. I know we all love that. So, want to open it up to questions? Yeah. I know you're waiting. My, <laughs> my major question right now is with the size of revolutionary clinics and NIDA, 
one of the things that happened in Oakland and in California and in San Francisco is through the Office of Cannabis, the bigger companies like NIDA and Revolutionary Clinics and FLAB and some of the bigger companies were forced to pay money into an equity program. And we don't have that bank of money right now. Has it been a two-edged sword with the fact that equity, equity wants to go first in a lot of communities for larger companies? With someone like, do you think that someone like Med, like MedMed or Harborside coming in now would be willing to fund an equity would be able would be able to fund an equity applicant? And would they want to, or would they see you as the competition? So it's a two-edged sword about that money. Yeah. And a lot of Oakland is suffering, right? A lot of the equity program at Oakland has been fighting back and forth because there was money from the larger companies that they were given, but they're, they're being seen as the competition, so they're getting killed on the inside. They right pulled now. out the money? There's also breadcrumbs. There's also yeah, like exactly. $100,000 loan is not going to do anything if you need $2 million to open up. So I think it really it, it goes back to like the devil in the details. The agreement has to be good. You ha they can't have ownership in your company. That's not how this should work. Like y they need to be doing all they can out of the goodness of their hearts because you know they're supposed to support equity. But that's not the best model for a business because their interest is to maximize profits and equity takes away from that. So that's, that was a great discussion last night with both Kobe and Caroline on the social equity panel and. Um, thunderous round of applause when they both said they each own 100% of their businesses. Exactly. You know, and build what Caroline said yesterday, try to build small, stay within your budgets, but to Joe's point, you know, there, we go back to that responsibility of people giving back to this community, being part of it. There's a fight on in Cambridge about that right now. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Joe's right there, right? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, my question is actually about it. So, to play um, devil's advocate, so you're right to say that in almost every single situation where there's fewer journalism and less local reporting, less local pride about reporting, and somebody doesn't sort of write properly or film properly, um, that's a bad thing. And yet, in the case of Cambridge, they're trying to do some really interesting things. They've been on the microscope. I've been going to the council hearings since about a year and a half or so, around the same time, maybe a little bit after MRCC started going. And I like to be part of that democracy because it's so much coverage, and still they continue even last night to kick the ball a little bit further down the field without hitting like the goal line. All I'm going to say about Cambridge is that it's at the point where both sides are split amongst themselves. I get pub publicists who cost $3,000 a month calling uh, us, as I'm sure they're calling everybody else. Cambridge is an interesting one. It's not what it <coughs> appears to be, but Cambridge actually has some coverage. Cambridge still has the Chronicle, which is, you know, so there's, there's, and also it's right next to Boston. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm really, I don't know if there's a question or if I'm answering it, but Cambridge is a, I'm not going to say there's too much coverage. I don't think that there's a thing. I think there's coverage and people can, they can watch the raw, they can read the different articles and compare. Um, I think with cannabis, I, I don't think that anyone's going to disagree with me on this, is there's a lot going on behind the scenes. There's a lot of Freedom of Information Act requests to be uh, filed. We have a God knows how many in right now in different towns. Um, and, I, and I know the Globe does because you know, a lot of these are open. Um, so that, I think that's really the name of the game. So when I talk reporting, the kind of reporting that needs to be done, I don't just mean going to the meetings. That, at the bare minimum, is critical. And you're going to get that in Cambridge, a very wealthy municipality. Some, what was the number? Someone threw out. One, one dispensary alone is going to be doing hundreds of... You know, 90 million. 90 million. Yeah. Um, so, but, uh, so yeah, I, I think Cambridge is an interesting situation. And I think Boston, uh, the, the coverage... Uh, and I'll, I just want to say one more thing on this, is that I do believe that sometimes the, the kind of coverage... Uh, and I don't want to just hammer the globe, but years ago, I'll give you an example, because someone brought up Harborside. They kept Harborside out of Boston because... Uh, of a, uh, literally, I think it was the... A felony. Well, no, it was a, a graduation of a college. On no, that was a different one. Though. Oh, it was that a different a, one? Yeah, was you, a different that, yeah it's good so Some of the coverage... But his was, uh, he had a felony in another state, but with cannabis. Mm -hmm. I'll just say, some of the coverage mm -hmm. of cannabis, especially early on, was was to such an extreme degree that, like, that kind of attention is never paid to poverty or, or even the Liquor Licensing Commission. Um, so that can, that can definitely be good or bad. But no matter what, hey, remediate that. I think the more the better. Karen? Thank you. So, Mike, I know a little bit about you. Um, a, for a long time, no, good. I'll be nice. 
Uh, for a long time, you were on the board of directors uh, with MassCan, and you predominantly operated and managed um, a, an event, a series of events called the Battle of the Bands that led up to the rally. Mm -hmm. And it was integral to working with the local Boston music scene, and the winner of this got to play at the rally and the headliner, and it was like all Boston inside, right? So my question is, um, Having done that, and now that we we don't no longer this is no longer a thing that's happening. We don't have the Battle of Bands anymore. Do you think that that ha that <coughs> losing that that activity has affected the music scene or the Boston cannabis community in any way? Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I I, uh, <clears throat> I I guess I don't know. You know what I mean? Because the reason I say that is I'm not close enough to it. You know, mostly I walk dogs. Like honestly, <laughs> like I, I'm like I'm a small business owner now, and I mostly walk dogs. I do my weekly show, and uh, sometimes I send articles to Chris Verone. He's the man, um, and you know. So I don't know. Like I'm not around that as much, like the music scene or even Mass Can. So, but it was a big thing then. I well, think that I think that was like a big part of it back in the day before legalization. It was like. That's where it started. It was like those musicians really like raised money. They were like yeah. artists were like, you know what? We we want to smoke weed. We want to have concerts where people aren't drunk. Mm. Like that was like a big thing for people. And we want to play a big festival on the common, and it's not like drunk people fighting each other because that's like a big fear for a lot of the bands that we used to book too, right? Like mm -hmm. the Dark Bar Star and Road Steamer and Barbecue. I mean, even the hip hop acts. Like you know what I mean? Like so. Everyone loved it. Everyone could come together, and it was, yeah. So I, I know it was I an opportunity. There was a great opportunity there for upcomers to get a stage yeah. in front of tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. you know, and when you're trying to be seen in the music industry, what better platform I to have? I hope it's still there for people. Know. I hope it, I know that the, there is a gigantic music and art scene in Boston that uh, is underutilized in, in connecting to the cannabis, to cannabis community, and I think that the Battle of the Bands, like, if that could, you know, re rebirth that would be like something that people would love to be a part of right. any questions out back I was sweating from that Kara question <laughs> <laughs> because you know me too <laughs> you can bury me you too. can bury me you weren't very nice thank you I'm trying to give you your kudos you I, so, I appreciate it I want, I want to ask one more thing of each of the panelists I want to know what your uh, your favorite Stoner song is, so to speak. Oh, damn. Oh, man. <laughs> Should have asked us about 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this high life cipher crew out of the UK. It's crazy weed song. But I'll think of something easier. I'm just going to say anything Money Man. If anybody here has Spotify, <laughs> check out Money Man. Because Money Man talks about growing weed, growing your own food, making, being your own boss, being your own business owner, and a lot of positive things. A lot of cannabis incorporated in there, too. So check I'm a big fan of Looney's. Yuck Mouth, I got five on it. Uh, I Classic. Actually, I actually got to hang out with Yuck Mouth one time. Uh, we were coming from, uh, we were doing a show, and uh, I was uh, holding my camera, doing video. This must have been 15 years ago. And uh, we were doing a show with Pimp C. And Yuck Mouth was there, and we leave. And um, I happened to be in the back seat with Yuck Mouth. And here he goes. He's rolling up. I don't know what he was smoking, but he, I brought it back from Cali, Cheddar. <laughs> he pulled it out, it stunk, and it smelled great. And I, it was just way more than I ever smoked in my life. <laughs> I enjoyed it, and I just said, yo, hey, Yuck Mouth. And then he met me in Atlanta and did it again. So. I got five on it was always my favorite song from that moment on. That's one I definitely vibe to myself. I'm gonna go, go with Smoke Buddha and uh, Red Man and, uh, and local uh, uh, MBS Salad Bees. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> really? I'll put that up against any, any other track. A few years back, I got to smoke a blunt with Red Man and Method Man, and it was like, I can die now. You know, that was like the, one of the highlights. Oh, wow. So. All right, well, let's hear, have a round of applause. Thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. Um, you know, feel free to mingle around a little bit, network and stuff of that nature. We have a bunch of events going on the rest of the week as well. 
Um, we have an industry mixer tomorrow night, which unfortunately is sold out. Oversold. 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 Um, <laughs> so, and, and so, so everybody knows, like one of our missions here, um, we had an event last night that was a free educational panel. Tonight was a free event. The industry mixer tomorrow is a free event. Um, I've been doing this a long time, traveling around the country to, you know, different conventions and stuff like that. And we know how the process works and I'm always frustrated when people are overcharging for networking and mm -hmm. education. So one of the missions of Boston Cannabis Week now and moving forward is to always provide free education and networking for the people of Boston when this week rolls around, so. Nice. Yeah. I just want to, uh, if I, can, if I can plug real quick, we have some flyers in the back around National Expungement Week. If anybody knows who's someone who's been arrested in the past, we're having legal clinic, clinics across the state. Uh, the one in Boston's on the 27th. And you can find more information at MA Consumers, at Dark Matters Media, and Loud Minds TV. Thank you very much. You'll find, you'll find National Expungement Week set up at the rest of the events throughout the week as well, so. I just gotta plug one thing before we all leave. So Sunday, Experience Boston. In Block Underground, we will have Lupe Fiasco, we will have Slain, we will have Bia, Latrell James, Marcella Cruz, Jeannie Santiago, Lisa Bello, Superstar Snuff. It was my mission to put together a lineup that could not be more Boston. I wanted to take the artists that don't get to go on every festival. We see a lot of repeats in the city, a lot of artists get the same opportunity. And we wanted to put them with an artist that would bring a crowd like Lupe Fiasco. So I hope you will all be there. I hope you will all support these artists. We will have live art installations, food trucks, vending. My parents are coming to town. It's like we're oh, that sold it. Yeah, that sold it. So I'll see you all there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.